Hello, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue uh, our day, and uh, we are going to have a uh, keynote uh, speech now uh, from Professor Mario Montenegro Campos from UFMG. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Uh, as you are going to see, the subject is very interesting. Uh, the talk is going to be about detector and descriptors for 3D reconstruction of real scenes. And um, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Mario. Uh, he is, as I said, from UFMG. Uh, he works mainly with computer vision and robotics. He is the founder of uh, the vision and robotics lab in UFMG called Verlab. I invite you to visit uh, the homepage of this lab and see the awesome works they developed there. He is a distinguished lecturer for uh, IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. Uh, he has got his PhD from UPenn uh, in US. And um, he has been working with several interesting uh, projects regarding vision and uh, putting these vision projects uh, within robot, ro ro robots. And also uh, in haptics, uh, multi-robot cooperation, aero robot robotics, and robotic vision. So um, I invite you to also thank uh, Professor Mario. Thank you again for accepting. And uh, the audience is all yours. So thank you very much, Anderson, for this very nice and gentle uh, introduction. Uh, actually, it's an honor for me to have been invited to be a, a keynote speaker at SIBGRAPI. Uh, this is a very uh, nice and wonderful uh, symposium. And uh, actually, I actually was very uh, surprised when the, that invitation came, and it took me a while to actually to decide. Right. So thank you very much for coming. Here this afternoon, we must be tired by now with a very long day of uh, workshops and, and technical sessions. So the, uh, the theme of my, uh, my talk will be basically uh, what it says there, but I'm going to bring in some, some other stuff. Uh, I would say that's more like 3D general stuff. As uh, Andrew has mentioned, uh, my, my, the work that we develop at uh, the Computer Vision and uh, Robotics Lab, uh, of course, has the Computer Vision a dimension to it, and also uh, the application to real uh, scenes, real environments, because of robotics. So there's some differences when you talk about robotic vision and computer vision. They're the same, but sometimes the problems they they, they pose some uh, some different constraints. So going back, way back actually. So initially, before you guys were born, maybe myself, the computer vision paradigm was that of cyclopic vision, right? So the idea is that given one image from a scene, you were supposed to recover the three-dimensional information of it, right? So a lot of stuff came out of it, wonderful algorithms, but the thing is really hard, we know that, right? We lose one dimension there. So natural, naturally, next step was to use two images, right? So then you have all the shape information from stereo vision, okay? And uh, all right, so stereo has done it all. We know we have wonderful uh, stereo vision algorithms. They do a lot of nice work. We can do a lot of a lot of stuff with it, but it's still very hard, right? So with the technological breakthroughs and of course several new algorithms, we have new devices, right? So these new devices that are really becoming available now make it easier for you and for me to deal with uh, real-world three-dimensional information. But nothing is that easy, right, as you expect. So even though they're becoming 
ubiquitous. You find this everywhere. You can buy kinetic, uh, Exxon, whatever, you name it, for very a uh, uh, couple of hundred dollars. Uh, the new algorithms, new techniques are necessary to actually handle the information that these devices are putting out. So you have several of these coming along, and you, you guys must know all of them maybe, right? The, the structure, for instance, is very, is very interesting because you're able to connect this to your iPad and you get the three-dimensional information, range and uh, image information from uh, your environment. And of course, you have 3D cameras and so forth and so on. And also, there are some unique devices, like the Velodyne. So uh, this device is able to produce 3D information around you in a very uh, active uh, frame rate, right? Basically, frame rate. And uh, this is the Google car. Who has seen this car already? OK, almost obvious. So would you kind of just click there? So the reason why I brought is, uh, this here, you have audio too, I think? You have audio? Today, we That's have okay. something extra special for you guys. And you guys will be some of the first people outside of our team and outside of Google to ever ride in it. Oh, there it is. Oh, wow. isn't that cute? So you see the Velodyne. What's this thing? All right, so technology, right? Nope. It's okay. It was in English anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, what you see here is, of course, this car is self-driving, right? And of course, all of you guys know about it. And the reason why I brought this video is because. Uh, in order for this car to be successful, of course, it's not only harder, right? No, don't try it. Forget it. <laughs> it's a lot of softer, right? The car works, hopefully, right? No, it does. Uh, and the point here is that uh, in, in order for it to perceive the environment, it acquires data from that Velodyne sensor that's spinning around. And of course, you have to make sense out of that data. That's a lot of data being pumped per second there. So it, you have to do a lot of, of computation with that data. And that's computer vision. And there's a lot to be done there, OK? So there's just one device that actually is out there that produces a lot of range information or distance information, uh, and uh, hopefully video them also. So can you just keep that for me, please? Actually, this guy is blind, right? So he's 95% blind. So this is the Velodyne. For $70,000, you can buy one, OK? Next. So it's me, right? Of course, you can. Uh, you guys have seen all this also, right? The reconstruction of uh, outdoors and indoor environments. Uh, this is a very well known uh, work building Rome in a day. Uh, you can use this to, mo to model. Oh, you need light. Oh, he needs light to take pictures, see? That's computer vision again, right? Without light, you cannot do anything. OK, so you, you have 3D modeling of people, and of course, modeling for recognition. And uh, one of the key challenges, of course, in all this, what lays at the bottom, right, uh, is actually descriptors. Descriptors are a very fundamental piece of this whole uh, jigsaw puzzle. And this work I'm going to present uh, is with uh, Exxon Nascimento, a former student, now professor at uh, UFMG. And uh, it has to do exactly that. Since we have 3D data, 3D data right? So what is there? Is it possible to actually build a descriptor that uh, use the information from both image and depth information? There? And of course, the answer is yes. So as a summary of my talk, I'm going to just give a brief review of to the, uh, to the key points and descriptors. Then I'm going to talk about 3D descriptors. There's not a whole lot of out there, and actually on the effort of building a 3D uh, descriptor and some applications, if time permits. So 
The feature extraction uh, pipeline, as you may know, it composes, uh, it's composed of three main steps. First, we have to detect features. So feature detection is one step. Next, you have to describe that feature. So one thing is to detect a feature, a feature, and then you have to describe the feature. And then, of course, you have to find the correspondence or the matching of those features. So if we could draw this pipeline roughly, the idea is this. You have, as an input, your images. Then your detect is going to, of course, <coughs> encounter uh, or define where you have the, the characteristic of the most interesting points in those images. And fr from those points, actually, around the patch, uh, the patch around that point, you're going to have uh, uh, a descriptor, right? And, and then finally, you use this information to perform the matching. As you can see, and this uh, this from uh, OpenCV, you guys who know Open, OpenCV, this example is there. Uh, you're not always successful, as you can see. You have wrong matches, right? So, the most important thing is for you to have the best descriptor ever. So it should be unique. So there's some important characteristics there. So, so we are leveled as far as the nomenclature is concerned. What's a key point? These terms have been used in the, uh, in the literature. So all this refers to the same thing. So when you read, it's roughly the same thing. So it's a local feature, interest point, feature point, patch, distinguished region, features, and so forth and so on. Now, as a matter of fact, when you talk about point, a key point, we think about a point in, in geometric terms, but that's not actually the case. We wish it were. But the point is, the point, <laughs> no pun intended, is that you should check the region around that interesting point. And that's, that's what uh, makes it uh, become discernible or distinguished. So you want to have a patch that makes that point distinguishable. In other words, anywhere you see that, you're going to know that it refers to the same point, right? So it has to be robust, robust to occlusion. It should be local. We're talking about local uh, uh, detects and descriptors. And should have a, a discriminative surroundings. The next step is the detector. Once you, uh, <clears throat> okay, see the detector, right? So you have an input image, the detector, and then you have your key points. So here is a list, of course, the list is almost endless of detectors. You find numerous detectors out there. And these are the main ones, I, uh, we should say. Those who are based uh, on derivatives like uh, Harris, Harris Lapla Laplacian, and Harris Affine, which uh, really uh, relate to second derivatives. and other uh, descriptors, and one of the FAST, one which is called FAST, right? It's being heavily used. And here's some of the, uh, the main characteristics uh, as far as properties and performance are concerned. So these guys are considered mainly corner detectors. These are considered blob detectors. <coughs> and these are the properties. For instance, these guys tend to be scale, uh, sorry, rotation invariant. That's important because you, when you receive another image, this, this image may come rotated with respect to the one that you're actually testing to. Some of them are scale invariant. Some of them are fine invariant. So it depends on the type of transformation that uh, you're imposed to. And as far as uh, these properties are concerned, these are very important ones. For instance, repeatability. You want to make sure that it's repeatable. So every time you find that, that, that key point, or you find that key point consistently, right? As far as localization accuracy is concerned, it's very important. For some applications, for instance, like camera calibration, you want the position, right, to be as accurate as possible. Uh, robustness, of course, you want to be, uh, so it's it, uh, it, uh, uh, robust to change illumination and other uh, type of nuisances, right? And you want it to be efficient. One thing that I actually forgot to point out is that when you look at the pipeline, don't worry, I will be moving forward. <laughs> Otherwise, you think I'll never end, right? So uh, <clears throat> when you look at this pipeline, <clears throat> as you can see here, you first have to detect, right? So finding, encountering this uh, detector takes time. And when you look at the descriptor, to comp actually to make up this description, which is actually a vector I'm going to show you in a mo moment, it takes time too. So you want some, some uh, uh, actor, some descriptor that uh, it's fast to build this vector, and of course, since you're going to do the matching later, you you need to have it fast to compare as well. 
because you can build the vector very quickly, but if it takes long for you to compare the vector, so when you're going to do the matching, it's going to take forever. You, you, you don't want that, right? So that's the main idea. So what's a descriptor then? A descriptor then is the uh, representation of color, intensity, other characteristics uh, on, uh, on the region as, uh, that surrounds that detector. And normally, as I mentioned, this is a, a vector of several bytes in length. So here you have, as input for a, for a descriptor, uh, the, the key points that you detected, and then you generate a list of descript, uh, descriptors in those images. This is a list, of course, abridged of descriptors. You have numerous, and this basically uh, is like in uh, chronological order of appearance, right? Some of them you know, of course, SIFT is well known, has 35,000 or so, something like that, uh, citations, right? Uh, Surf is another one that you may know, right? So in there are several others. Now, the last part is the correspondence. So given the descriptors, what you want to do now is to compare uh, the descriptors among themselves so you find those who, who match, right? So that's uh, uh, one of the main, uh, the main goals. Now, if you want to read a little bit more, this is a very interesting paper that actually uh, tries to determine what's the best combination of detector and descriptor. So it, it doesn't mean that every detector works well for every descriptor. So you have a better combination there. So I won't have to talk, talk about this now, so you should just check this paper out. OK. Now, we talked about 2D descriptors and detectors. What about 3D? Right? So that's the whole point here. For a while, people have used 2D descriptors to work with 3D uh, data. It works, but of course you can get better because range information, depth information is very rich. So if you can use that information to actually help you to build a better descriptor, why not? So that, that's, that's where basically Erickson uh, endeavored to go in his uh, PhD dissertation. So the idea is how to design, what's the technique to design a descriptor, a good script, a robust descriptor for 3D information. Before I go into the details, this is a list. This has been published in 2014, and uh, we're glad that our, descri our script is, is listed there. And these are the main feature descriptors for uh, 3D, right? Uh, state of the art now is considered to be C-shot, a color shot, which basically combines visual and depth information. Now, what are the, uh, the properties that you want from a descriptor? You want it to be robust to noise. And noise is a big nuisance that you have with this range devices. If you get a kinetic, those who, of you who have used a kinetic know how much, how noisy this thing is. So you, you want your descriptor, therefore, to be robust to noise. Of course, you have noise in the image, too. You want to be invariant to scale because you may get this information from different uh, distance from the scene, right? And rotation transforms. And of course, as much as possible, you want your descriptor to be invariant to illumination change, changes, right? And to lack of texture. Of course, a lot of descriptors, they, they are based on the gradient information, which you actually get from texture in the image, right? And you want it to be fast, both to compute, to determine, right? And to compare. And not only that, you want it to, be, to take a small footprint of your memory because you end up having a lot of those descriptors when you're actually doing some work. So you want to be compact. So here you have Google Glass. You know, Google Glass has a lot of processing side, has memory side, and it does a lot of processing like that. So you, you want your descriptor, if it's going to work with 3D information, to be able to fit in these embedded systems, right? It's very common now to have these quad rotors or these UAVs with um, cameras. And of course, because of payload, these guys uh, usually they take 200 grams or 500 grams payload, so you cannot have some heavy device there. Uh, so you, you need to have some small processor with small memory, right? And should be, of course, you cannot have uh, some very uh, powerful computer on board. And of course, the main goal is to have this running on your cell phone, right? Which actually happened. This is an actual image, right? Uh, this image is from the, a project by Google called Tango Project. Those of you who heard of Tango Project, 
everybody. So, you know, good. Okay, so in summary, these are the properties that are desirable. Robustness noise, invariant to scale rotation, invariant to change in illumination, texture independent, fast to compute and compare, small memory footprint, and of course you want it to be independent of the key point detection or the detector. So we want to, to have a descriptor that is, will be able to work with several detectors. So that's the idea. So this is a typical image from a, a kinetic, right? This is a mobile robot. And this is the RGB image. You see it's very, it's still very bad, right? Uh, and this is the depth image, which is even worse. You see a lot of noise here, right? Uh, holes, right? Which becomes a nuisance to you, right? So that's the type of uh, data that you have to deal with. So as far as image descriptors are concerned, these are the main descriptors, right? And uh, of course, these you know, and brief uh, is one that uh, uses a bit string as a descriptor, right? These guys use floats and so forth. As far as geometrical descriptors are concerned, the most well known, I think, is spin image by Johnson. That's from 99. But this only dis is a descriptor of the geometry, right? Now, when you get the combination of two, when you get both image and uh, depth information, uh, C-shot was, it is so far, I think, the state of the art. So if you, even this 2011, right? So that's the most recent one. Okay, so when you compare these descriptors with the, uh, with the, uh, the characteristics that you want, you see uh, this black dot means that it covers that characteristic. A uh, little empty dot a circle says it covers approximately. This just qualitatively, right? There's nothing quantitative here. So just have an idea. And we have a dash means does not cover. So as you can see, uh, as far as the requirements are concerned, of course, these uh, well known they cover okay, right? Uh, but some of the some of the situations are concerned concerning to us that for instance, these guys they demand memory, right? And as far as load time to compare, as we're going to see, it's not that great. So as far as the ge geometric are concerned, this spin image, of course, you would expect to be uh, as much invariant as possible to uh, to rotation, illumination, and of course texture. C shot covers quite well here, right? And Brief by Calander covers well as far as, as, far as uh, uh, performance is concerned. Now, so what's the methodology that we use? You want to, of course, maximize the coverage of all, of all those uh, properties, right? And, of course, you want to take advantage of both texture, or image, and the geometric information. And as far as detect is concerned, you use STAR. So basically, this is the pipeline of the methodology. You have the RGBD image as an input, and you have the key point, and then you basically have to find out the, the scale. And uh, with the scale, you actually derive your canonical orientation. And from that, you actually fuse. You use those fuse simply to say how you're going to combine the, the information, right? Uh, after some pattern analysis, so then we generate our descriptor. So as far as, as scale is concerned, Somehow it's uh, easier, right? Because uh, we have the depth information. From depth, depth information, you know that this point, for instance, is farther away than this one. Okay? So basically, we derive the radius based on the depth information that will be taken from the depth image. Okay? So that's the idea. And of course, we compute the scale from that. As far as orientation, I should not lose track of time. Please help me. Okay? As far as uh, orientation is concerned, we basically use a uh, surf-like uh, method, which is, uses the HAR, right, detectors, right? And, uh, and as far as fusing is concerned, we use both the information from image domain, which is the gradient field, and geometry. And we use two uh, alternatives, and these are going to generate two different descriptors, actually three different descriptors. The extended Gaussian images uh, due to BKP horn, right? And uh, the normal displacement. And then we perform the information fusion. So in order to reduce sensitivity to, to noise, we follow the same uh, well-trod path, which is to smooth the region with some Gaussian, right? The Gaussian kernel. And somehow that becomes more stable. You lose a little bit of the high frequencies, but that's fine. That's a trade dot I've had to pay. As far as region analysis is concerned, I'm uh, we we define the pairs like the like brief 
does. So you have a region and you have a distribution of pairs of points. And basically what you do, you compare, uh, we're talking about the gradient field, you compare the, the value of the pixels uh, in these pairs of lines, in the extremities of these pairs of, uh, of, of lines. And the, for instance, if POI, if the, if the intensity here is smaller than in this point here, you set the, this to 1, right? We're talking about a, a binary descriptor. And if it's other way, otherwise it's 0, right? Okay. Now we're going to come to the combination of the information. We have the gradient field. And we're going to use, for the, uh, for the depth information, the extended Gaussian images, right? So the idea to use the extended Gaussian images is that you have invariance to rotation. And this is a well-known technique. So basically what you do, you, you perform the analysis on the image using the, the spare distribution. I can check the paper by Calandra. The pa paper on brief is the same, the same idea. Uh, and you also compute the normals. To, so you can compute the Gaussian image. This is just a very broad overview. From this region analysis in the image domain, you obtain 32 bytes. And from the depth information with the extended Gaussian image, you, you, you obtain the 64 bytes. So your descriptor now has 96 bytes only. So it's a binary descriptor, OK? So as far as the representation is concerned, of course, you can think about a vector of floats, which is commonly used, right? One of the problems, of course, it has a large memory footprint if you want to store floats. IEEE 9794, right? 794? 754? I forgot now the, the standard. What's the standard? 754, right? Help me out. Whatever, right? OK, so one of those standards. Uh, and uh, it's not uncommon for you to use 96 floats, which is very large. For it, that's for each descriptor. So the idea of using bit string is exactly that. So you have a smaller footprint, and since it's a bit string, you can do fast comparisons by using the Hamming distance. So it makes it fast. And of course, you can think of a bit string as something very short. So you usually have to just 256, 256 bits per signature. OK? Now, so a DVD is the first one. The second one is called brand. With a binary robust appearance and normal descriptor, it's, it's a nice thing to find names for these descriptors, right? So you want to have something unique like Sift, Surf, Brand, no, you name it. You have, so I have to make up the name. And again, you use the gradient field, and you use the uh, now for your depth information, you use the normal displacement. And the main idea for the normal displacement that is that when you have a surface, you compute the angle between normals. So you have a test here that basically. Uh, tells you how far apart these normals are. So this gives you, gives you an idea about the, uh, the, 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 the characteristic of the surface, right? And of course, we have another test that, that gives information about the curvature, OK? OK, so when you have these two informations, so the distribution patch, so this is the image information, this is the depth information. From this, uh, from this uh, distribution patch, you, you get the key point orientation, right? And from the depth information, you get the normal, the normals according to these tests here, right? And then you make an OR. There's an explanation why the OR is good. So it's somewhere there in some, some of the slides. Uh, and then you generate this binary descriptor, OK? So that's, that's a very compact one. So when you compare now the, uh, the characteristics that you want, so we believe that brand is able to cover uh, them all. Of course, we haven't shown this yet. We're going to show it shortly. Now, it is the case actually that oftentimes you don't need, in, uh, you, you actually don't need to have invariance to rotation, nor scale, or you can live by without it. That's very common. So if that's the case, then you don't need the full-fledged descriptor. You need, you, you can actually get by with some, something that's simpler and faster. And for that reason, then. Uh, the base, which is another nice name, binary appearance and shape elements, uh, was created. So the idea is exactly like brand, but it, you remove the rotation variance of it, right? And the scale variance of it. That's it. So it becomes much simpler. So it's faster than brand. But of course, you have those limitations. It becomes much simpler. So basically, you have your RGBD image, your key point, then basically do the fusion of geometry 
uh, in appearance, right, in generated binary descriptors, uh, descriptors. So some experiments. The experiments were performed using the Freiburg data set. Uh, and there, it's very interesting because you have uh, actual real data from uh, actually obtained with a Kinect, right? So it's several real world RGB data, it's public, and uh, you have a ground truth camera so, to compare against. So some of the, uh, the elements of this data set contains just translations, simple translations, right? X or Y translations. You have rotations where you rotate about the main axis or like a yaw angle, right? You have free hand movements, sorry, where you move your kinetic freely in, in the environment. And uh, you have uh, a set where you have uh, images acquired with a mobile robot. It's a pioneer. So several, several tests, uh, of course, are performed by par a parameter setting, matching, rotation variance, processing time, memory and memory consumption, key point detection variance, right? And the comparison was made against SIFT and SURF, spin images, and C-shot. We want to see how well our detectors, uh, our, descri our descriptors, sorry, would, uh, would perform. So this is the distribution I was talking about uh, that brief uses. So you have the uniform distribution. That's a Gaussian here. Uh, a Gaussian here, this uniform distribution, then the uh, learn. Uh, there's some reason for that. So uh, as far as the eDVD is concerned, for those distributions of the patch, uh, you obtain uh, these results, right? Uh, using uh, uh, using the, the HAR, the... So, I see. I know it's a C's. Yes, intensity centroid. That's right. And the uh, the performance in terms of enlarges, which is radially in this graph, right? This sometimes this is plotted uh, horizontally, but you can see that for both uh, uh, I C, right, and bin, we have uh, sorry, in, uh, with the HAR wavelengths, we get a better coverage, right? Okay, this for the canonical orientation. Uh, this for Brandon Bayes descriptors, uh, similar uh, observation is, is obtained, right? And this uh, is how it performed as far as the recall and one minus precision curve, okay? So you, you can see that Brand uh, performed well. Uh, the blue, it's interesting to note this blue line here has to do using texture only. So it's somehow it's close here, right? It's not, it's not that bad. And this for uh, the matching of the uh, of the that, that last phase, right? The matching of the descriptors for brand base eDVD compared to C shot, surf, sift, uh, and spin images. So you can see that somehow the uh, brand base and eDVD they perform better than C shot. Actually, that time was the, the state of the art for both translational motions and rotational motions. As far as rotation invariance is concerned, we did this using synthetic in a plane uh, and introduced Gaussian noise. And these are the results. I'm, I think I'm boring with so many graphs, right? So it's hard to, to look at them all. But anyhow, you, what you do, you increase noise and see how your, your, uh, your uh, descriptors, uh, uh, they, they behave. So again, in layers are along the radial direction. And this is the coverage in terms of in layers. So you can see that somehow brand any DVD, then they tend to be more stable, even though you increase noise, right? Uh, and surf actually varies quite a bit depending on the amount of noise you have in your data. Okay, as far as processing time is concerned, we ran this on a, uh, with this configuration, right? And of course, using the star detector. So remember, I mentioned to you the time to create and the time to compare. So this is time to create several of these descriptors, and this is time to compare these descriptors. So if you look here, you have base, surf, uh, and brand, right? And eDVD. eDVD, of course, because it's more uh, complex, it, it, it takes longer to create, right? But nevertheless, it's way less than C-shot, and even less than spin images, okay? As far as comparison time, which is very important when you're doing the matching, you can see, uh, Base is right here, brand is right here, and DVD is right here. DVD loses to surf uh, by a little bit, but still uh, has a very, uh, very fast comparison time. So as far as memory consumption is concerned, since we're dealing with binary descriptors, uh, you can see here that uh, uh, the amount of memory that you take with your, uh, your descriptors is very small, right? Base is very small, it's roughly the same here. Uh, DVD again loses a little bit for surf, and other than that, uh, we do better, right? 
Now, this is important. This one is a, is a very important uh, result. Now, we want to see how much the descriptor changes or is affected by the type of detector they use. So, in this graph here, you see the different uh, descriptors, right? The DVD, brand, base, surf, sift, C shot, and spin. And uh, uh, this actually is area under the curve. That's what you measure here. And these are the detectors. So, when we say here, for instance, uh, sift, we're using the sift like or sift type of detector, okay? And the same thing for surf. Now, nice thing to notice is that somehow the variability uh, on the type of detector they use for these three uh, descriptors is very small. And furthermore, they cover a larger area of the curve, right? And if you see on the right here, uh, these are the results for the, the other descriptors. And especially C-shot, you see it's heavily dependent on the type of, script, uh, of detector they use. Okay, so again, this is very important to, to notice because we want to be uh, uh, be able to use any detector that that is actually suit us. So, if you consider now the three uh, descriptors that uh, were derived in, in this, uh, this dissertation, uh, you can see that the three of them, right, they cover pretty, pretty much well. Brand covers all the properties, right? EDVD less so, and we explain why. And of course, a base which does not have scale and rotation variance. Now, some results, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this one is the, yes. So this is a reconstruction of our lab, okay? And you see some robots there, right? So this was performed, as you can see, there's a little circle here. A robot was placed position in place and rotated about its own axis. So that's how it got the information. And of course, uh, you have to remember that uh, kinetic has a range of uh, at most four meters, right? Three and a half, four meters. Uh, the, the whole area is seven, about 70 square meters. Okay. Now, one, one, one important thing is that uh, when you say poor lighting conditions, what we did, we turned off the lights of half of the lab, so we have very poor light in that region. And uh, this is a very interesting result because it's able to show you that uh, uh, we're still able to reconstruct the scene even under low illumination. Okay, but there's a caveat here. Of course, we do that because the information that we obtain is, is through infrared lighting. Okay, that is why. Okay, and, but that's, that helps. That's why by combining this type of information, you actually uh, get a better results. So you can see this part, even though it's darker, you still be able to, uh, to reconstruct. It automatically does it by uh, obtaining the information from both, uh, both the scriptures. And now we have to turn off the sound. This, uh, we've shown this in uh, a previous uh, SIP graph, right? So this is a construction with, this is a quad rotor, and it's carrying a kinetic here. It's flying uh, randomly around, uh, it's fly, flying by hand, it's not autonomously, right? You're flying around this statue, and it's outdoors. Uh, of course, it was shady that day, but uh, nevertheless, it's outdoors. And this is the result of the, the reconstruction. Yeah, there, there was there was a kinetic there. Can you can we rewind this? I don't know if we can rewind. There's a kinetic mounted uh, at, at the the landing poles of the of the quad rotor. Actually, this this quad rotor is a little bit sturdier, so it's able to carry carry more weight. Okay, but of course, what happens? Autonomy goes down. Okay. All right. So this basically the conclusions. Uh, I think you you were able to to see that. Of course, the it is robust scale and rotation. Right, uh, Brent covers all the criteria. Basis basis faster, but uh, it, it, it fails on scale and rotation. <clears throat> Let me move on because of, of time. Okay, we 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 pre, we plan to do some other works, right? And some of these works that we plan to do is, is that we are not very satisfied with the <laughs> with the quality of their construction, right? This has to do with, uh, of course, with the poor uh, uh, resolution of the camera and of the 3D range uh, sensor, right? And, uh, okay. 
Now, as far as time is concerned, uh, we have shown this already, right? So you can see here how these compare to uh, other descriptors. This one uses NARF. NARF is only a geometric, uh, another geometric uh, descriptor, right? Okay. As far as memory is concerned, uh, descriptor size for brain is 32 bytes, for surface to, to 256 bytes. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is a hint for me to stop. No, <laughs> just for a pause. Okay. <clears throat> now, what's next? As a kind of follow up, we did this work with Claudio Fernandes. This was a dissertation, uh, uh, actually, a thesis, right, which is mestrado. And um, one of the problems that we usually have is called. Uh, Loop closure, if you do like a slam, monocular slam or something like that. Loop closure is, is basically the following. Let's suppose you start to scan this room. And as you move about uh, and you, you start to register all these point clouds, the tends, you have some drift. So if you come back to the same place again, the thing does not close. So that's the loop closure problem. So uh, inspired by the work uh, of some people in CSI or with the ZBD, ZBD is basically a laser range scanner, uh, which has mounted on it an IMU, or AHRS, which is uh, Inertial Measurement Unit, or Attitude and Heading Reference System. Basically, it has three uh, accelerometers, three gyrometers, and uh, three magnetometers. So getting that inertia information, <clears throat> you're able to actually derive what's happening while you move about. So the ZBD is, uh, uh, was base, is actually basically a, a device where you have this laser scanner, it's a line scan, and uh, this IMU mounted on it, it's mounted on top of a spring. So the guys basically just move this thing around like you you do with uh, Agua Benta, right? <laughs> and how do you say Agua Benta in English? I have no idea. Huh? Eh, holy water? Okay. Good. <laughs> That's easy. We should be careful with this straightforward translations, right? Go ahead, go de cabeça, and so forth, right? <laughs> So, uh, and by moving this around, because we me you measure the, the, attitude and, uh, the attitude of the, of the device, you're able actually to reconstruct the whole thing. So what we did here is similar to that, but instead of having this spring thing, we just basically mounted uh, an IMU, IMU, AHRs, right, a device, on top of the kinetic. So we now we have this inertial measurement system plus the kinetic. So we, we have the information provided by the inertial system, plus the information provided by the kinetic, right? And uh, so I'll, I'll go through it. So we want to basically do the same. Given a set of RGBD images, you want to combine them uh, in such a way that uh, they represent within the same, the same frame, and possibly when you move around to have this uh, closing a loop. So this is the IMU that I used. Sometimes they call this MARG for magnetic, uh, angular, rate, and gravity. That's another way to call it. And this is basic, the basic reference system that you have to, uh, to use with your kinetic. And uh, the problem we want to actually tackle then was this problem. When you actually move about, I don't know if you're able to see here, but you have some discontinuities, right? when you compare to this, right? Especially if you look at this region here, right? You see there's some inconsistency, right? So can we do better? The answer is yes, right? So the whole idea behind this was to use the, uh, the information from the inertial system to give us a coarse alignment of the point clouds. And based on that coarse alignment, we were able then to do the fine alignment using uh, regular techniques. Of course, monocular Islam is, is well known. It's single camera and so forth and so on, right? And the strengths of monocular Islam are because you just use an expensive sensor, and you also may recover some texture, right? The disadvantage is that they require rich texture information. If you don't have texture, then you're doomed, right? Because it's used image, right? And sensitive, of course, to lighting conditions. <clears throat> Geometry-based point cloud registration is the, the strength that geometric features are usually abundant. You have a lot of them. The disadvantage, you do not take the full advantage of the RGBD because you only use the, the depth information. Now, the idea of the RGBD's lamps is to combine 
all this information, and this is called RGBD snap by, by Henry et al. Uh, and the strengths are RGBD sensors are inexpensive, of course. You can be able to capture geometry and texture from the scene. And what are the, the uh, disadvantages? It's noise, the limited depth range because uh, of your limitations, right? Uh, and RGB blurring, which actually is a big hindrance for you to uh, make your, match, uh, your matching of adjacent, adjacent uh, frames. Okay, so this is basically uh, the main, uh, the main uh, previous work using RGBD and inertia information. So it's quite recent, right? So this guy, they, they actually they tried to improve on the work of uh, Henry and, and colleagues. What are the problems? The problems that uh, they discarded the inertia information when the attitude diverged a lot. So they basically uh, assumed that the visual information was more reliable, which is not necessarily the case. And the other problem, they didn't take on the global optimization, optimization issue. So the, the framework that uh, was designed was basically this. You have your depth, sense, depth sensor. Uh, sorry, I said kinetic. No, we mounted the, this IMU on top of uh, Action, right? So it's slightly smaller. And the, and the IMU sensor. So from this, you get uh, your points, your key points, and uh, you compute your descriptor, right? Guess which descriptor you used? OK, you guessed it right. <laughs> we used our descriptor. And then you perform the matching. You obtain the cost alignment. And of course, you do the photo consistent alignment to get the things uh, in shape, right? That's the front end. As the back end, you, the attitude information is used uh, for the alignment. As I mentioned to you, the, the loop closure problem is actually uh, uh, helped or uh, tackled partly by this phase, right? And then the final optimization, so you basically get the environment map. I'm going to go quickly through this. Basically, you have the key points matching as a front end, so you subsample key points from point, point clouds. Uh, initially, you do not know the rotation, the translation, right? But remember, you have your inertial system that is able to help you. And then you align the attitudes of the point clouds given that information, right? Then you do the, the matching, right? Find the best translation. Of course, the best means the best you can come up with, right? Uh, and then you use this information to, to obtain the remaining correspondence, right? Then, of course, the, your uncertainty regions are going to be smaller. OK, then you repeat, re repeat this process for all the other uh, key points. And then you find a score, which is computed like that. Uh, then what you do is you have to, uh, basically to, uh, to register all this information uh, from all the, uh, all the different views. And you do the alignment uh, like this. So because if you actually keep moving your kinetic for several uh, frames, the tendency for, is for this to diverge, right? Because of accumulated error, even for your AMU. It's important to note that uh, we mentioned that uh, this uh, unit has a magnetometer. The key idea behind the magnetometer is as follows. If you just use your uh, accelerometer, right, as you say, it's very simple. I just integrate twice and I get position, right? But the point is your accelerometer has a drift. So if you keep moving your sensor, your IMU sensor, with time you're going to get a drift. So this drift is going to take you off course. Now if you have the magnetic information, magnetic information is pretty much stable. So you can use the magnetic information to somehow remove the drift. There's some tricks to do it, right? Common filters and things like that. All right. OK. So then you, you detect some, some uh, key frames, and then you find a key frame that's, basic, that's basically consistent with, with what you've been getting so far. Uh, and then you perform your loop closure. So the idea is that when you move around, you expect to arrive at the same place, right? But somehow it doesn't happen. So then you start to compare your last frame with the first one and see uh, uh, with the previous ones and see how far apart you are, right? And that's when you use the information from your IMU, okay? I just want to move this very quickly. So I think you got the idea, right? Yeah, I have some time, right? Okay, good. But anyhow, I'm going to, to go quickly. And I have more stuff to show you, <laughs> okay? So uh, then you detect the, the, the loop closure and you, and you close the loop. Okay, also a loop, a loop is closed if the score, a given score, is 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 met is met. Okay, so let us see some experiments. Can you click there, please? 
I think there's a movie there. Again, the same lab. So you already know my lab, right? No, not yet. So maybe the next one. Okay, it's the next. One. Okay. So what, we're fortunate to have uh, some uh, some friends from uh, from CSIRO in Australia. They brought the ZBD and they actually scan our lab. So we use the ZBD as our ground truth. So we're able to compare uh, the, the the performance, right? So we chose 15 interest, point, uh, 15 interest points in the lab, randomly, and we, we computed this uh, between all these points. Okay, I think now we have the video. So that's the part that didn't close the loop, right? It does not mean that the lab is that dirty, OK? It's just because the texture is not that good. So. <laughs> but it's not that clean either. So, so as you can see here, at the closure, it, it closed really well, OK? All right, so uh, we do have some issues that we have to tackle. And of course, since I mentioned to use the magnetic information to reduce the drift, uh, you have to take care of this when you are indoors, right? You have to be very careful with that. But you, you can calibrate for that. This has been published in SIPGRAPI last year. And now we move on to the next step. You have audio? Hopefully. Audio? Oh, remove the thing. Up. With the right equipment. Is it an enhancement program? Can you clear that up, Benny? I don't know. Let's enhance it. Enhance section A6. I enhance the detail and it doesn't have to enhance release it to my screen. It has to be flexion. I'm able to run this through video enhancement. The video enhances. Hang on. I've been working on this reflection. There's so much reflection. Reflection. There's a reflection of the man's face. A reflection. There's a reflection. Zoom in on the mirror. You can see a reflection. Can you enhance the image from here? Can you enhance it right here? Can you enhance it? Can you enhance it? Can you enhance this? Can you enhance it? Hold on a second, I'll enhance it. Zoom in on the door. Times 10. Zoom. Wait, stop. Stop. Rotate at 75 degrees around the earth. Stop. Go back to the part about the door again. Got an image enhancer that can fit that? This software is state of the art. The eye can back this off. The right combination of the Lock on and enlarge the Z axis. Enhance. 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 Freeze and enhance. So simple, right? Enhance. Right? You guys know how to do it, right? So simple, right? I'm I'm just preaching to the convert here, right? So when you see this these movies, right? Just get a terrible image and just say enhance and tip. So let's see the next one. I have to move the right forward. Okay, try click click on it. Okay, now CSI, right? That's the serious stuff. Can you put the Actually, this one you don't need audio, okay? Look. Why why are you laughing? Oh zoom. Look at the screw, so simple, right? Look. Actually can I ask your students to do it. Right? right? Look, with that, they're able to find the the purple traitor, right? Look, <laughs> so you don't know who it is, right? Now, this, I, of course, we put it jokingly because uh, when you watch this, right, and some people know that somehow you work with computer vision, they say, oh, you can do that. So you'll say, yes, of course. More than that, but it's classified. I cannot tell you. you know. But anyhow, the <laughs> our inspiration was not that. Our inspiration was the fact that we're not able to get very good images from this reconstruction, okay? So you see all that dirty lab, all that stuff, right? And uh, the question is, uh, are we able to get uh, 
better images from low resolution images. This is not a new problem, right? This is an old problem and it's well known in computer vision for several years. It's called the super resolution, right? So, uh, so what I try to do is basically to get better images and better depth information from low resolution devices like the Kinetic. So that was the main drive, okay? And uh, our poor <laughs> master's student went after it. And this student was advised by Professor Erickson, right? So his name is Bob Yun. So that's what I'll try to show you in the, in the time that we have. Uh, so it's just an approach to generate super resolution depth maps from low resolution RGBD information. So that's the idea, right? So that's Daniel Bobino and Professor Erickson. <coughs> so that's the objective. Now, if you look at, again to uh, a typical image from this type of sensors, you're going to see that the depth information is really full of holes, full of problems, full of noise, right? And uh, that's really a big issue. So the idea then is that are we able to actually improve the image using the depth information and vice versa? There's nothing new here. We are not the first. But this is something that is happening quite recently. So the idea is that using multi-view, in other words, you, you have small displacements with your device, right? And the, you aim at your scene. And here you have as input several uh, low, le uh, low resolution images and depth information. So the first step in the pipeline is to register all this information. Right? You have to align them correctly. Then you have to perform some interpolation, just like it happens, happens in regular super resolution in, in, in images, right? And then you perform restoration, and f which means finally you obtain some image that will be in higher resolution. Okay. In this multi multi multiple view case, uh, of course, you have several images like this. And as you can imagine, they, they may come rotated a little bit, maybe different scales, right? Illumination changes. But somehow you have to register them together, right? So you're able to perform some final interpolation that would make sense. And of course, this pipeline, you can find this paper here. It's a very nice paper. OK, registration is performed. Uh, we don't do it, right? We, we borrow this from uh, the guys from Technische University of Mühlen. They, they have a very nice uh, registration uh, software, uh, which is based on photometric consistency. But the idea is basically that you receive several images, right? And you have to, uh, to combine them, to align them, uh, so they are properly set in the same uh, reference frame. OK, next step is to, to perform interpolation. Then the idea here is to, uh, to obtain this high resolution image from the low resolution that received the, the, in that you registered and you're going to interpolate now. OK, so we're going to think backwards. Let's suppose you, have a, you already have a high resolution image. So how come it becomes low resolution? So it is assumed that a, a few things happen to that high resolution image that somehow transforms this into a low resolution image. So this is a supposition of how things actually happened. Other problems may happen in the way. So let's suppose you start with a high re resolution image. Then of course, for several reasons, even your optical system, you may have some warping, which already changes your image. And of course, Due to limitations of your hardware, right? Even your optics, you it may have some blur. And you don't sample it, meaning that you actually lose information, right? And furthermore, you add noise. Of course, you, noise can be added anywhere here. So this is the final image that you obtain. Okay? Assuming that that was the case, what you want to do is to work backwards. Well, that's so simple, right? You just remove noise, you up sample, you deep blur, right? Whatever. You want to warp and have the image. Simple problem, right? Of course not. <laughs> you have a lot of work to do. And 
you know, as an inverse problem, you, you have to, to work with uh, optimization uh, techniques. So again, that's what is expressed here. So we want to find a high-resolution image, IH, that better explains the set of low-resolution images, IOK, that went through this transformation. So we want to basically find the IH that minimizes this, uh, this objective function. So we use a regularization term for consistency of the solution. Okay? And this lambda, we, I say empirical chosen, actually was try and error to find what uh, the value of lambda was. Okay, in final, of course, you have restoration, which we don't uh, spend time with. Uh, but basically what you do is you remove no uh, noise, blur, and improve contrast, so you have a better looking image, okay? As far as image super resolution is concerned, you have the work of Unger in 2010, Unger and colleagues, 2010, and depth super resolution by Schwann and colleagues in 2009. So this means they just did, just quote, right? It's already hard enough, image super resolution, and these guys here, they just did, just again, quotes, uh, depth uh, super resolution. Now, the full-fledged thing where you have both depth and image super resolution was performed in, in 2009 by Stumer and, and colleagues, and more recently by Li and Li. That's a problem with Chinese background authors, right? So, Li and Li. Oh, maybe Korean, right? 2013, but this is the more recent work. So what's uh, our methodology? This is the idea. So you have the RGB data and you have the depth data, okay? So you initialize your system by providing uh, this I0 and D0, which is image and depth, and cast it into what we call the initial frame. An upscale operation is performed, so you obtain a pair of an image, G hat, which is the, we consider the super resolution image, right, that we are going to improve, and D hat, which is the depth super resolution, resolution information that we want to improve in the process, right? So that's how we initialize it. So the depth information is used for you to perform the uh, reprojection, because th those things were in, Remember, you're moving your device around. You're moving it around. So every time you move it, you're in a different uh, reference frame. So you have to recast into the original frame. So that's why you have to perform the reprojection. And this, this is done by using the depth information. Okay? Again, using the, this information, now you, you receive as input the remaining images, low resolution images. And from that, you generate a set, right? It's, it's, of course, it's, it's a continuous system, right? It's a continuous flow. And you do upscale in both image and depth. And you perform this optimization step, which, if it's not converged, has not converged, you obtain a new estimate for your depth. So the depth is used for you to adjust uh, the, 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 uh, the, the generation of the new, uh, the new image, right? So use depth to improve image, and vice versa. Until finally, you s given a certain criteria, say it's, it converges, the, and then you obtain an out output, which is the G hat and D hat, which, is, which are your high resolution image and depth uh, information. Okay? Is it clear? Okay? So that's the main idea. So you can find this in the paper of Lee and Lee. So this is basically explain where the reprojection happens and projection, so forth and so on. So th things that you guys know. Uh, K, by the way, is the, ma is the matrix. Have five minutes? Oh, okay. Uh, of uh, intrinsic parameters, right? And S is the information for downscale. Okay, so since I have five minutes. So, okay. The optimization then is formulated as an urgent minimization problem where we have the re regularization term, the image term, and the depth term. Okay? I won't go into through all these details. You can find this in his dissertation. So, Again, you have to deal with this L1 norm, L2 norm, right? So you, you can see that if you use L2 norm, of course, it, it basically uh, smooths out the image and don't want that. You want to keep your edges sharp uh, against some global cost function. So let, let me go move on since I have a very short time <laughs> to the experiment. So some experiments were performed with synthetic data set and uh, with a real data set. 
right? And both in the lab experiments. Uh, the comparison was performed with with the standard bicubic, bicubic interpolation, which uh, basic, uh, is standard for this type of uh, work. Uh, what we call SR, which is by Unger, and SSRDI, which is by Lee, and of course the method that we propose, which is called RGBDSR. So these are the synthetic images that you guys know from Middlebury uh, data set. And uh, so you can see the images, right? They, they are obtained random poses. So 14 images are generated, right? Low resolution. Uh, in 50% of the elements of this data set, we introduce this hole here, this synthetic, right? So it's just a rectangle, black. Okay? So this is the depth information. So there's no information here. Okay? And uh, that's how it was validated. Okay? This this the let me just move you. So this is RGBDSR compared to bicubic, right? You, just qualitative. You basically can see uh, roughly. It, it does a little bit better. You can roughly read here, right? Uh, this is closer, so you can see. So this is the ground truth. Then uh, the same thing with holes and without holes. This is our method. This is SSRDI, that's state of the art in the super resolution. So, as you can see, that's in the image. Of course, the image we have seen already, that uh, the performance, right? But it's what's quite nice about the results that are obtained that when you look at the depth results, uh, this dotted, uh, red dotted rectangle here basically shows that the, we were able to actually recover the hole. Right? The same thing as did us SRDI. But this, uh, th this is a difference, right? This is a difference between the ground truth and the, the, the reconstructed one. Of course, we commit some mistakes here, right? So does SRDI. But you can see overall, right, overall, uh, our restoration is better. You, you can see here you have these uh, uh, artifacts here that are not shown here. So the super resolution technique was not able to recover the hole. Okay. So this is uh, uh, important. Why? Because besides doing the uh, obtain a better image, right? We also obtain a better depth information. Okay. Second experiment. This was test against different baselines. What I'm, we mean by baselines that is if we're moving the the, the device, right? Very distance among the poses, right? That's it. And this basically show the, the performance, right? As you increase the baseline, of course, you expect it to, to, to go low. And it compares with the state of the art, right? Now, with holes, we do a little bit better. OK, a little bit better. Uh, again, on depth, as you can see on depth, SSRDI basically stays here, right? I, I think I mentioned to you this right here. Hold on a second. Uh, oh, it's, sorry. Moving the, the, the wrong way. Uh, and this uh, without holes on depth. Okay. Now, uh, this is the instance uh, called XYZ1 on the Freiburg data set. And this is how uh, it has, has been uh, reconstructed. So this is the original. And this is the, uh, our method, RGBD, DSR, right? Now, uh, this is an animated GIF where you can see various poses of, of the original and the reconstructed one. You can see it does better in several locations, see? Around the mouse, the book. Even the monitor screen, which is kind of hard because you have a, a dark screen, right? It's very dark. Okay, and these uh, are experiments taken from the lab. So this is the ground truth. It's high resolution. 
and this is the regular kinetic resolution. Okay, uh, this is possible because it, this kinetic is the kinetic one. It provides you this uh, the image with that resolution. So you can see the the, the reconstruction here, right? This is the same thing, just in numbers. Okay. Now comparing the the three uh, the original SS, SSRDI, so you can see the the Im image wise is is comparable, it's, it's quite okay. But when you look at the depth, this method actually uh, performs better than the the state of the art. You can clearly see the the depth information of all these little robots in the in the shells, right on the shells. So you can now just uh, a zoom in in this book here. So this is the ground truth. This is the bicubic uh, SSRDI. You can see it failed here, failed here completely, and RGB DSR. Same thing for the corner of the window. All right, the book again, and that's basically it. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Mario. Uh, very interesting work. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Who's going to be the first? Don't be shy. Just tired. <laughs> well, if you do not make any questions, we are not going to have the cocktail. Whoa. <laughs> so I have. Uh, let's let That's me start. Chair. <laughs> so let's start with one. Uh, <clears throat> how? Difficult it would be uh, to extend your approach in the first one and in the second one here, instead of working with the depth. Suppose that we want to work with the time information. So you have a sequence of images, like a video, but you do not have the depth. How do you see the extension of the work to solve that kind of problem? Oh, that's an interesting, quite interesting question. Um, Actually, this uh, this has been done in other works as well. So you you, con you consider the, the each frame in time uh, as one column, right, of your of your image. Uh, I suspect we have some problems with uh, temporal consistency, depending on the uh, depending on the frequency that you acquire those images. So if they're too far apart. You not may you may not be able to get a good interpolation between the these suppose columns. that's the that thirty frames per second. That's a hard one. Uh, we have to see. Uh, I don't I don't really know how to answer this now. We have to we have to think about it, because uh, when you think about the the uh, the sampling, the sampling may become an issue. So we we have to see. Uh, we can try. That's a good yeah. good, good suggestion. We, we have this problem. So you have this problem. We should talk. Okay. Good. 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 <laughs> Any other? Okay. <laughs> no, uh, that's a good you. motivation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the talk. It was really nice. I just uh, have a question because most of the work you did were was using the kinetic. Yes. Which is very noisy and hard to work. So you think the method it works um, better than the others because it handles the the let's say the things that the kinetic doesn't do well like noisy and data and stuff, or as let's say that this device is, gets better, a simpler method will work as well, or your method will always be ahead because it has some certain characteristics um, that it's not just handling bad input. Yes. No, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Uh, that was ex expectation when we had the first cameras like the regular uh, scan line cameras, right? Uh, some of the problems actually minimized when we, you increase your uh, resolution, but you never get away with them altogether. So uh, you, do not, you never have a perfect system, an ideal system. So we believe that uh, the techniques may, uh, may be v coming very handy, uh, even in situations where, where we have uh, high resolution uh, devices. Uh, of course, we compared our work with other works that use the same device. We uh, should be getting a new uh, new kinetic version two uh, sometime this uh, this semester, 
which has high resolution. So of course you can perform the same uh, experiments and see how much improvement we're able to get. But the problem is that we use, we need to have some ground truth, and uh, we have to find out uh, where this ground truth is, uh, so we can compare with to see how much better we can do. Of course we can compare with our, our previous work, right? But uh, I think there is always room for improvement. And as I said in the beginning, uh, the the challenges that we have is not only uh, that we have newer devices, but but in fact that we need uh, new algorithms. Uh, that are able to handle not only the this type of data, but the, the, the flow, right, the, the data flow, which is uh, very high. So, we, of course, we have works like Kinetic Fusion that does this, uh, this in real time. So one of our, uh, our challenges would be actually to get this stuff uh, working, right, in, uh, uh, in a frame rate. So, okay. Uh, they cancel the, no. Uh, he already got his ticket, so. Okay. <laughs> Any other? Uh, hello. Uh, in the examples you have shown, uh, most uh, depth images were just small translations. And it seems that it works more like a way to denoise then you increase the resolution. And if you want to keep the same hardware and increase the resolution, you would, the only way would be to zoom the connect to near the, what you want to increase the resolution. Can uh, you, you think you can do that? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the experiments, I think I went through it uh, very fast, so let me see if I can back, if I can backtrack here. Oh, the whole thing shut down. But one of the experiments, I don't think I made it very clear. What happened here? Disappeared. Something happened. Oh, start Windows normally. <laughs> Something happened. Now, one of the experiments that we've done, actually, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the word baseline. Uh, in that experiment, the the kinetic actually was moved quite far apart, so the motions are very large, right? We're not only rotation mo uh, motions, but we also had some uh, approaching and far going farther away motions too. So, uh, but we did that randomly. So we don't, we have, the, we have that pose, so we have an idea of roughly how far apart they were. In that graph, we actually show that we still, be able, we, we still were able to actually recover it quite well. Okay, I, I'm not sure if that was your question. Oh, it's coming back here. Let me see if I'm able to show this. I don't know what happened. It's coming back, but it's too slow. OK, you guys can wait for more, half an hour before the cocktail. It's coming up. But anyhow, I, I can show it. If, if you come up, I'll show you the, the graphs, right? So. so one of the difficult things, actually, to perform these experiments is actually getting ground truth. That's that's hard, right? Even if those, uh, Danielle had to implement those methods, because it they don't give it to you. So it's very hard for you actually to, to come up with these experiments and compare them. It's a lot of work. And uh, when you perform these motions and stuff, you, it, it would be better if you have some kind of ground truth to do that too. So. Any other? No? Everybody's tired, right? Yeah. So uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, we are going to have the cocktail at 7 p.m., so you have some time to go around and maybe return to the hotel, and we see each other again at 7 uh, downstairs.